Jim and I have been doing a continuing legal education program for lawyers all over the United States for the last, what, five, six years now? Uh, no, not that long. <laughs> Time doesn't go 2011 that fast. is our first one. And so what we're going to what we're going to do tonight is what Jim's thought was was first of all just to ask me questions. I said no 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 no. I said let's give these people just a little sampling, pull a little bit out of our three hour program, uh, and sort of condense it and give you a uh, a fly based on on travels we've made in north, south, east, and west, where we've talked to people who are. Trump supporters, people who are not Trump supporters. Uh, so we assume there are some of both in the audience tonight. Uh, but anybody who follows me on Twitter knows where I'm coming from on a lot of these issues. Uh, Jim, of course, is uh, a, uh, what are you, Jim? <laughs> you going to reveal it tonight? Yeah, no, I, no I, I'm, uh, I grew up in a family that was longtime Democratic family um, here in Ohio. My great-grandfather was the chairman of the Democratic Party, and when he died, he was the Register of the Treasury for Franklin Roosevelt, and he was also the president of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. <laughs> it's true. Wait. Very true. What, what Jim is leading up to is to tell, when he told me that story, I said, Jim, did you know I was in the International Brotherhood of Magicians? He said, I didn't. I said, I, I really left the Brotherhood when I pulled the one great trick I'll never be able to reproduce. And that was making Nixon disappear. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true. I wrote him, he was, he was in Australia with your book, Worse than Watergate. Worse than Watergate. And uh, he wrote back and said, I, my greatest trick was to make Richard Nixon disappear from the Oval Office. So that's how we started. So we got together here in Ohio, 2004. Um, Dick Cheney and John Edwards debated at Case Western Reserve, a very forgettable debate. Um, <laughs> but I did a series on Ohio and its presidents and asked John to come because John had written a book about Warren Hardy because at, at parts of his life, he lived in Marion, Ohio. He was my first president, actually. Yeah. And so when Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was doing a series on the presidency, he asked John to do the Harding book um, because... I had lived in... In Marion. Marion. You told him that you had taken down one president. You wanted to bring another one back. Well, that's, that, I do. Uh, you're, see, he's stolen all my jokes. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, well, that's what makes I it tough. I tried to give it to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So anyway, we did this uh, program, and it was fun, 2004, and many years later, I wrote this, the Harding book, which is my second book, and many years later, I, I said, John, I went to a continuing legal education program today about the Kent State shootings. Uh, it was really fabulous. You know, these people had film, and they had people who were there. It was really fantastic. And so I said, what were you doing that day? And you were actually with J. Edgar Hoover. I was with Hoover, and he was saying some really ugly things about the, the kids who were killed. Yeah. And it was a really, rather depressing day. Yeah. And, and I, though, what I did respond is, you know, I do CLEs all the time, as you explained the CLE. And I said, what we ought to do is put a, con a continuing legal education program together that's a little bit different than the norm. And that's what we've done, and that's what we're going to pull a few uh, clips out of tonight. This yep. is normally we do lessons for lawyers, but we're just doing lessons in general tonight. Uh, but let, let me give you a little background on Jim. So he uh, thinks this is hilarious. This is yeah. me <laughs> watching water. <laughs> but what, what's he watching? You know, yeah. that's, that, that's uh, <laughs> it's obvious. You know, the hearings... This is my favorite, here. This, this is Jim's favorite. Th th these are photos we found when we were assembling the program, and when he realized who had been there... Uh, that is John Lennon. And, uh, you know, I really... I found the photographs of Lennon and Ono, Yoko Ono, coming to see John testify, because they were... He is, was being hounded by the Nixon administration to deport him, uh, mainly because he was anti-war, but it was some marijuana charge or something like that. So um, I said, John, this is fantastic, you know. And, and uh, I said, I knew you were, I knew you were important, but I didn't know you were that big. <laughs> well, I, I must say, I I had never 
been to hear the Beatles sing, but they did come here to me sing that day. <laughs> anyway, Jim's not. I didn't steal that joke. No, yeah. uh, let's go back here. Yeah. Let's go back. I went to. They jumped yeah, you a went couple. Too far. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay. Back to the Ohio State from which Jim graduated. Oh, hey. a, 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 a picture of uh, a, an arrow pointing to Jim's office yeah. in Cleveland. <laughs> Yeah. See, he's an important partner. He's yeah, so these, these are my three books that have been out. The first one is about the guy I was saying, the magician politician, my great-grandfather, my mother's grandfather. The second one is the Harding Affair that comes from finding at the Western Reserve Historical Society, they had a microfilm of love letters between Carrie Phillips and Warren Harding over a 15-year period of time. Um, 900 pages and they're filled with handwritten yeah yeah they're filled with all sorts of sex in them I mean but um, the uh, the real story I ended up finding out was she was a German spy during the First World War so it's a but what's also interesting is Harding does every er, at every turn does the right thing yeah. So he's yeah, not in She threatens him, and he still votes for war. She's very, she was very pro-German. When I did, when I did my Harding biography, uh, one of the things I had suggested is that now that we're in a DNA era, we could find out if indeed Harding did have an illegitimate child. Uh, I put it in a footnote. Jim actually picked up the project uh, when, as a result of working on the letters, and the long and, and short of the story is we now know that the family, uh, Summit, Jim's urging, uh, one of the, one of the uh, I guess it's a great, nep great nephews uh, who lives in San Francisco, got a hold of one of the great grandson of, of uh, Harding's purported daughter, and they'd had their DNA test done, and it established, indeed, there was paternity. Right. So it, yeah. it resolved the, the mystery. Yeah, John wanted to solve it for a long time, and so he talked about sneaking into the, na the Library of Congress where these letters were and getting one of them to get the saliva from the back of a... <laughs> and I thought, that'd be good, John. That'd be really good. So January 73 is the, the book that's selling tonight. It's about this great month that changes our history. It's the end of the Vietnam War, Watergate burglars trial, uh, Harry Truman dies, and then on the same day, January 22, 1973, Kissinger gets on a plane to go back to sign the peace accords in Paris. A few hours later, Harry Blackman walks out on the Supreme Court and announces Roe versus Wade. And then three hours later, Lyndon Johnson drops dead in Texas on one day. So I looked at this as we were working on our program and I said, this is an amazing month, and it turns out it is, so that's that book. And this next one that's coming out re really this week, Ballots and Bullets, um, and the subtitle is Black Power Politics and Urban Guerrilla Warfare in 1968 Cleveland, is about a shootout between black nationalists and white Cleveland policemen, and 10 people were killed, 15 badly wounded. So I look at that story, how did that come about? And that's what's coming up. To do this series, one of the things I insisted that Jim get back in to listen to tapes, he get familiar with uh, some of the original documents, and original testimony, and this is Jim over on the right there, literally visiting the scene of the crime. That's the back door they went into the Democratic National Committee. Right. Uh, that picture of the, of the Watergate was your picture, Jim, isn't it? Yeah, I took it. They, they now, the hotel's back open again, the Watergate, and you can go to the very top, and that's the view from the top. There's a bar up there. So if you go to, uh, go to the Watergate, you, you go there and just go up to the bar, and you'll have this, one of the best views in Washington you'll ever get. And if, John tells me... Yeah. If you use one of the house phones, when you get on hold, they play Nixon tapes. <laughs> <laughs> so you could literally be there and you'd be hearing yourself yeah, yes and, I, uh, could. Yeah, <laughs> I could your 34 year old self anyway uh, to uh, introduce me Jim just generally reminds people I'm still married to Mo <laughs> that usually gets a round of applause <laughs> <laughs> and my background is I went to Capitol Hill shortly after law school and quickly became the chief minority counsel I was with a law reform commission during the 68 campaign. Nixon, of course, wins in 68. I am invited to come in uh, during the uh, transition 
to meet with the Attorney General designate and the Deputy Attorney General designate, and they asked me if I will come to the department because of my experience on Capitol Hill and work as the Associate Deputy Attorney General for legislation, which is, that's where I was, and having, because my bosses did not like to go over and do background briefers at the White House, I found myself frequently going over there, meeting with the staff, getting to know the staff, and when John Ehrlichman decided to really take charge of domestic policy, he had been White House counsel, uh, I was asked to come over and uh, take his job. Uh, John did give up the title. He never really gave up the job, uh, as we'll explain a little bit tonight. Uh, so I become counsel in July of 1970, served for roughly 1,000 days. Uh, post -water all, all of 30 or 31 years old, think about that. White House counsel. Uh, after a, a career in business, uh, in my, when I turned 60, I'd done two books, uh, Blind Ambition and Lost Honor, which relate to Watergate, uh, but I've been cranking out a pretty steady diet of books uh, since. You can see so, the Warren Harding book up there in the, in the middle there. It's yeah, that actually was a, a very good book. Uh, <laughs> of all the books. They're all bestsellers, Jim, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyway, my last book, I, had I known going in what I was getting into, I probably wouldn't have taken on the project. Uh, it was, it's called the Nixon Defense, and I thought I could very easily go in and get selective tapes that others had not had looked at to explain uh, how fallacious his defense was that he knew nothing about Watergate until I had told him uh, some eight months after the arrest when I start having dealings with him, and before that I had really only had one or two meetings with Nixon, uh, but eight months in I start uh, having regular meetings, and I realized as I started listening to the tapes that, yeah, the, here are some that aren't done, but I really need to listen to the tape in front of that one and sometimes in the one behind it. make a long story short, I then started looking at the transcripts that were available, and they weren't very accurate. They had been done by secretaries at the FBI, and some of them couldn't identify whose voice was actually uh, speaking. So I figured while I'm young enough and uh, have the energy to do it, why don't I just get in and do them all? So the first job was to pull all of the uh, catalog, all of the Watergate conversations, starting with June 17th. He actually doesn't get back to the office till the 19th. And I found roughly 1,000 conversations relate to the subject. About 600 of those conversations, I don't think anybody outside of the archives had ever even listened to. The archives listened to them for purposes of processing. And what they had done is done a very crude catalog where they would hear a name and then they would put that name down, say Kissinger, and he'd be talking about the Paris peace talks. And so it'd be Kissinger, Paris, peace talks. And you could use that as sort of a device, and it's pretty good. Uh, it's, a, it's called a subject log, and you can actually get in and, and extract all the conversations. But it turned into a four and a half year, almost five year project because I wanted the, I ended up hiring a, a, a number of graduate students. Um, the lead uh, student uh, had, had the good fortune of, of having experience as a, a legal secretary. And she kind of, she was a little older than the others, and I put braces on her two of her kids in the, in the, in the project, but uh, she took charge of it, and you see the, that's, the, that's the whole set of the, of the conversations there, about, uh, about four million words, and I'm not sure which was harder, which was to uh, transcribe the tapes or to turn around and boil them back down and pull the narrative and dialogue out to make a reasonably a readable book, and uh, that was equally as hard. Uh, here is but the, but the good news is that I you still a, you still had your hearing though. Well, I did, uh, I, but I was worried as I told Mo. Uh, that he's setting me up for a joke. I've told <laughs> the past. Yeah, he's. Uh, I told Mo during the project. I said, you know, I started wearing earphones to do it, and soon I transferred to uh, large speakers, and I had different software. And I said, God, I hope I don't lose my hearing during this process because men in my family started losing their hearing in their 70s. And, and I said, God forbid the last voice I hear is Richard Nixon. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I didn't make it through. See, that was worth the setup. <laughs> yeah. Let's, right. let's, uh, let's give you the story of how the tapes uh, appeared here. Yeah. 
I do not, in fact, know if such a tape exists, but if it does exist and has not been tampered with and is a complete transcript of the entire conversation that took place in the President's office, I think this committee should have that tape because it, I believe it would, be, it would corroborate many of the things that this committee has asked me to test. Mr. Right. Chairman, this concludes my rather lengthy statement. I apologize again for its length, but I sought to comply with the committee's request to provide the committee with a broad overview of my knowledge of this matter. So that, what, can I interject here? What's really cool about that little piece that you just saw is when John testified in June of 1973 after he broke with the White House, he really didn't know there was a taping system. And he created this, this how many thousand words was it? Uh, six or seven thousand word statement that you... That oh, he, my testimony? Yeah. It's 60,000 words. 60,000 words. And if I had been told I was going to have to read it, I can guarantee you it would not have been 60,000 words. <laughs> So he, he, can't, he comes in to read it, but before he finishes that statement, at the very end, he puts in, I thought in one of the meetings I had with Nixon after I'd broken with the White House, that he might have taped that meeting. That testimony you just heard yeah. is the part I inserted. But, so let's go back to just very, a sidebar here. That night, it's April 15, 1973, he's broken. Nixon's had him come back. It's a Sunday night in his office in the executive office building. So you uh, can pick it up from there. It's about 9 o'clock at night and you come Well, in. he's asking me leading questions, which was unusual. Uh, he had normally just would listen and what have you, but he had leading questions that were clearly indicative of he was hoping I would not give the answers I was giving because uh, I wasn't biting on what uh, he obviously thought would be a soft answer I, at, at that late stage in the game. Uh, and as he was proceeding, he at one point gets up out of his easy chair. Uh, we'll have a, a picture of it here in a minute for you. Uh, and he goes over and there's a potted palm over in that corner of his executive office building office. And in a stage whisper he said to me, he said, you know, I was foolish to talk to Chuck Colson about clemency for Hunt, wasn't I? And I said, yes, Mr. President, that's probably an obstruction of justice. Well, I, that's the moment it clicked that I thought he must be taping. So that's why I decided when I was doing my testimony, I, had, I was reading the final copy, uh, the first copy I had done in longhand, uh, then Mo had, had typed sections of it, uh, the parts that were actually readable, uh, my lawyer's secretary started typing, then I was working, reading a final draft of it, and that's when I decided I should slide in here but I think I was taped on one, one, at least one occasion, if not more, that testimony you just heard. And of course, that would be uh, both short-term and maybe long-term the most important testimony I would give. And it was uh, almost by accident that I put it in because it was a last-minute thought to, to add it. Yeah, I mean, to me, the serendipity of history is what's fun. But this, you know, this leads to questions by the Senate investigators of various people, including a guy named Alex Butterfield. Do not, in fact, no. It's a and this is a picture of him. And so he's asked on Friday the 13th, July 13, almost exactly our date here. Uh, or, no, I'm sorry, June. Um, <laughs> anyway, he's asked, is, a, is, is what Dean's saying possible that he was recorded in you know this conversation that he thought he had? And Alex finally says, after about a three-hour meeting, I'm sorry that you asked the question. Yes, it's not only possible, but all of the conversations were taped. Um, and so that leads to him then testifying the next Monday, this picture that you see right there, where the bombshell is dropped, that Nixon taped all of his conversations. And then the big question was, should he destroy those tapes? So maybe two minutes on that, on that your... Well, what, let me first set up where the tapes were. Uh, I think people are interested in, on, on, on that question. Uh, the Oval Office, obviously, but they were placed principally around the desk. Uh, that's Woodrow Wilson's desk that Nixon used, and they literally drilled holes right in the desk. And they run the wires, uh, drilled a hole right through the ceiling down to a locker room that was underneath uh, for the Secret Service, and they put the wires right into a locker where they had a small uh, unit with six-inch reels uh, and had a similar setup over in the, uh, there's the desk itself. I tended to sit around M5 was probably the most 
uh, typical. You person. had no idea that you were being taped no, in any no, of these other conversations. Than, other than to the conversation that occurs over here in the, this is his executive office, building office, where he actually did most of his work. You uh, all know that building that's right next to the White House, that big elaborate one. President, and, that had a huge office over there. A great office. Uh, here's another shots of the office, and that's the easy chair he was typically you'd find him in. And what happened is the quality of the tapes uh, are, are in direct proportion of the proximity of a speaker to the hidden microphones. Some of the tapes are really rough, to, to, particularly in the uh, executive office building. We were able to get a lot of them because technology has changed. They were analog when they were recorded. And they're, they're all digitized now, so you can play with them. And, and uh, but gets very distorted when you do so, but you can get a lot of the information. The only, uh, the phone calls and the only phone that was wired was uh, in, the, in the residence, the only taping at all was in the uh, uh, Lincoln City room, uh, that little prince's phone up there on the, uh, on the table. These are, these are great conversations. You can go listen to Nixon tapes online. And these ones... They're, broad, they're almost broadcast quality, the telephone calls. It's like you're on the phone with them. It's really amazing. And Nixon would go up there, introvert that he was, uh, and have dinner by himself, have his valet bring in drinks, start drinking, and pick up the phone. And, and as the night goes on, his words start really slurring, you know. Uh, and he'll have these incredible conversations that will last for 45 minutes with somebody while he talks Chuck Colson. How many have seen the movie The Post? Yeah. And you notice there's a, there are Nixon tapes on there, and those are, fo those are phone calls. That's how they used those uh, because they were the better quality. They also had a, a good system set up at the uh, uh, Camp David, his lodge up there, both his, his, both his phones, uh, and the room were, were wired there. Anyway, uh, the decision not to destroy the tapes, I think the only people that really recommended that he were, would get rid of them were uh, Pat Buchanan and John Conley. Uh, he didn't get rid of them because I think he believed, or Haldeman was on the other side of that, had been actually asked on two occasions to dispose of the tapes and had not followed up. And, the reason Haldeman didn't do it, as he later explained, is he was not a lawyer, but he thought they could selectively use parts of the tapes that were good for them and use those as a defense and just make the rest of them disappear. Uh, but uh, that would obviously be another obstruction of justice. So when his lawyer told him, no, we, we don't do that, so uh, uh, it, it was that, that theory didn't work. But Conley actually recommended that Nixon take the tapes out into the Rose Garden and publicly burn them <laughs> uh, and answer the question, you know, executive privilege, nobody gets these. And if that had happened, it would have been John Dean's word against the world. And what's interesting to me, having worked with him all this time, is um, 34 years old during the, the Watergate crisis. Think about your mindset when you're 34 years old. Challenging the leader of the Western world. You've got to stop this or it's going to kill your presidency. He's not going to do it. Then he turns and says, okay, then I'm going to the prosecutors, I'm going to the Senate. We are going to stop this one way or another. Uh, he gets death threats. He is in the witness protection program. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we keep telling young law students, sometimes the youngest people in the room are the ones with the most sense and who stand up and actually challenge power, you know, which was what John did. But when he did it, he didn't know there were tapes that were going to back him up. So it was going to be there. I've got a button that we use sometimes that a, a clip of that says, I believe John Dean, you know. Um, <laughs> but it's true, and it's also true that it took forever for those tapes to be released, and then when they were released, they were almost exactly what he testified to. So Well, they, they are and they aren't. Uh, I don't have the right dates. That was the, one of the things I found memory does. It conflates dates, and we're not, we don't have time stamps on our memory. Uh, so I uh, I noticed, for example, someone told me recently there was a study online now that, that where a professor had taken nine of my conversations, that's all he had, but he pretends like he has them all, and compares those with my testimony, and they don't fit at all. Well, he, he ignores the rest of the tapes where it does all fit if you, if you put it back together. I had to put on my glasses to see. I, I don't, as I travel now, I'm careful 
about wearing glasses because of an experience I had. I, I'm going to share with you as I think of it. Uh, being a public person, you get used to people recognizing you. And so I, I was telling Jim this story where a guy was sizing me up at LAX not too long ago, and I knew he wanted to come up and say something. And what he said and the way he said it, I can never forget it. And it's one of the reasons I don't wear my glasses regularly. He said, didn't you used to be Dick Cheney? <laughs> I, I, I really wasn't quite sure how to respond to that. I, I really, anyway, let's go on. All right, so when, what we found out when we went to do this program was that John's testimony was really the genesis of the modern legal rules. How many people here are lawyers? Okay, at least that will admit to it. <laughs> um, but it, it, the, we, got, we have these model rules of professional conduct of what do you do when this happens, when that happens, and that sort of thing. But it, the, the real modern rules go back to John's testimony. There was, the part we're going to show you here gives rise to a rule that says to lawyers, what do you do when you represent an organization, so you're not, and you're not representing any of the individuals, you're representing the organization, and that organization is involved in ongoing crime or fraud. What's the lawyer's obligation? And with John testifying, as you'll see, uh, all these lawyers that get involved in Watergate, you know, what was their ethical duty at the time? So that's kind of the and setup. What, uh, another reason I, I, we've included this uh, in this program tonight is because it's one of the few real impacts of Watergate that's had a lasting effect. I mean, it's, this is true today. It has been true uh, literally af within 10 years after Watergate. Uh, most of the impact of Watergate, with except, I'd accept the media, uh, where there's been permanent changes, but with the law profession, is one of the few that have been permanently affected by, uh, by Watergate. So we're going to give you a quick little rundown here of, of uh, that genesis. And this, this is the man, I, I happen to include in my testimony uh, material before for the Irvin Committee that the, Senator T uh, Talmadge, that first picture I showed you, where he spotted this document, and uh, the document's explained in the testimony I'm about to give, so I won't really. Uh, What's interesting dwell about on this it. document, and he'll talk about it, but look on the right over there. You can barely see it there. It says potential, um, and these are the crimes that were potentially in Watergate the o first. O slash J. Yeah, obstruction, obstruction of, of justice, which we spend a lot of time talking about these days. And that, so this was that this. Watergate put obstruction of justice on the map. It was the, the, the event that did so. Now, there it is again. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, now, will you look at exhibit number 43, which you inserted in your testimony yesterday. Don't you love that accent? That's also an interesting document. As I recall your testimony as you presented it yesterday, it's a list of all of the people that you thought had violated the law and uh, what the laws may be that they violated. Is that correct? That is correct. Let's start with the top of the list. Now, that's in your own handwriting, is it not? That is correct. This is a copy thereof. That is correct. What is the significance of the uh, letters at the top left-hand part of that sheet? At the, the list is broken down into two parts. Senator, one says pre, and the other is post. This was By pre, you mean prior to the Watergate break-in? That is correct. The planning and execution of those events. Is that, that is what correct. You, and you list in that category, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, and Mr. Strawn. Is that, that is correct. correct? Now you have a star by Mr. Mitchell's name. No star by Mr. Magruder. Well, let me understand. Let me maybe if I explain the whole, sure. list, uh, it would save some questions for you. Um, I have listed for pre Mitchell, Magruder, Stan, or Strawn, Post, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dean, Larue, Mardian, O'Brien, Parkinson, Colson, Bittman, Kambach, Tony. Uh, I have, that's the word source, I'll explain that in a minute, stands. Now, beside uh, several of the names, after I did the list, I said, uh, it had made, just my first reaction was, 
there certainly are an awful lot of lawyers involved here. So I put a little asterisk beside each lawyer, which was Mitchell, Strawn, Ehrlichman, Dean, Mardian, O'Brien, Parkinson, Colson, Bittman, and Kambach. So you, you heard the audience reaction there. And people were, you know, the, you're a lawyer, your people are committing crimes, and you don't have to do anything about it. You can just quietly resign. So the rule that changed was lawyers can now warn their clients, if you don't stop this, I may go outside the attorney-client privilege and report on it, you. It, so. it varies a little bit state to state, and, and we look at the law in each state when we go in. But, for example, today uh, it's clear who the office of counsel represents. When, when I was there, Nixon thought I represented him personally, as well as his family, as well as the presidency. I would end up doing things like working on his estate plan, uh, which today I guarantee you uh, Don McGahn, the White House counsel, clearly represents the office of the president, and that's it. That's why uh, Mr. Trump needs to have outside counsel. That's why Bill Clinton, when he had problems, had to get outside counsel. White House counsel has none of those responsibilities. So it's very clear, and it makes a huge difference in knowing who the client is, and it's one of the impacts that has affected uh, the American Bar Association has really not let up on it. Uh, after the Enron scandal, they, they pushed to the end and uh, make, to make sure the federal government didn't get involved in regulating legal conduct. Uh, uh, most states have uh, also subscribed to them, uh, and they are pretty strict rules today. Oh, there's the Enron. All right, so let's get to what we want to talk about here. <laughs> um, we, Last year, we were asked by um, a group called the Professional Education Group to go around the country to do our program and compare Trump and Nixon. Uh, we went to uh, the Northeast. We went to uh, New York, Philadelphia, and we were up in New Haven. New Haven. Then we went out to Denver and Phoenix, and then we went to Birmingham, Alabama, um, and a couple other places in the South. So we really went all around the country to talk about this and kind of took the temperature of people. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? It was very interesting. There was a lot of unanimity about comparisons and contrast between these two guys. But we started with this picture. You join that. <laughs> I don't want to steal one of your jokes. <laughs> I, I, as I told... <laughs> You'll notice the thumb sizes there, please. <laughs> Nixon has a much bigger thumb. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. We'll see you tomorrow. Also, there are striking differences. Uh, there are signatures, who, those who are into understanding signatures. Nixon has a very distinctive one. He went to undergraduate school at Whittier out in California, Duke Law. Uh, served in the Navy, went, had, saw uh, combat in the uh, South Pacific and came back and got elected co to Congress at a, a pretty young age, in his 30s. Uh, so a lot like JFK, you know, they had They were in the same class. Yeah. They, they were, went to Congress at the same time. Both Navy. Right. Uh, and became a senator when he was serving in the Senate. Eisenhower asked him to serve as vice president. And actually, Nixon would serve as acting president when Eisenhower uh, had his heart uh, problems. He, he specialized, his, his political universe really was, was the world. He, he knew it well, traveled it well. Uh, of course, as a lawyer, he'd argued cases in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, and he would pursue the, the love of his life from uh, he, when, when they first met. Uh, when I told Jim I'd learned that uh, that uh, Dick Nixon drove Pat on dates with other guys. Uh, you, uh, I, I always said that's pretty creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, he was he was somebody who really truly was prepared for the office when he took it. I was never sure when I went over there if there was a new Nixon. And for those of us who did not have access and uh, a lot of contact on a daily basis with Nixon, we thought there was a new Nixon. We learned in the long run that was a bad reading, that that's the reading they wanted out there. Uh, but uh, he certainly was able and understood the presidency. What is the book that you're reading right now that you think is one of the best? Uh, Jack Farrell, uh, John Farrell's his name, and it's 
it's Nixon a life. Yeah. Uh, and it's well done, very well done. It's the most recent biography. He's a, Farrell's a reporter and did some good digging. In fact, discovered that during the 68 campaign, Haldeman had made notes uh, as his sort of chief of staff for the campaign, showing that Nixon indeed had, as Lyndon Johnson suspected in 68, disrupted the efforts of uh, Lyndon Johnson to get a peace by South Vietnam going to the Paris peace talks, Nixon had sent a back channel message saying, I'll give you a better deal if I'm elected if you just hang on and wait. And of course, we know that would be four more years of war and, and about 30 more uh, thousand Americans would die and, and Lord knows how many Vietnamese would die. Uh, but anyway, Farrell did that kind of digging and... and, but, and your, but your thinking was that Nixon you, was known for being an attack dog in all of his campaigning and so forth. And in 68, he tried to make himself different. And so as you walked in there, you all believed there was going to be a statesman, a, right. a different guy. That he, there, there was that personality, but it was not the personality you've discovered when the doors were closed. I learned, I, I met, I was amazed when I listened to the tapes, uh, year, all these decades later, because I, I'd have to, you know, I, without being totally negative, there were some tapes that surprised me uh, because most of the personal stuff got removed from the tapes, that was taken out. But occasionally there's a conversation that would stay, uh, for example, when he first learns he has a peace agreement with with South Vietnam uh, in 70... January 73. That really good book written about right. January 73. He, he, has, he, he, has, he has a lovely conversation with his wife. Uh, he has some phenomenal conversations with his daughters. They had a love, I'm sure they were shocked when those tapes came out and they, if they have heard that, any of them, that there's a whole other man that was in, in the... Uh, uh, behind closed doors there. Anyway, let's look at uh, quickly at Trump. Uh, there's a different signature. Uh, he, of course, was a, uh, a good student as a undergraduate, secondary, and we don't know about his record at Fordham or Wharton, uh, uh, other than rumors, and they're not very good. Uh, he started at the top of the real estate business with his father leading him the way. Uh, he would... Uh, uh, well, these kind of speak for themselves. He, he's, had, he's had long battling wars. In fact, I talk to people who live in New York, and particularly people who are media savvy, and they say what's going on now on a national scale is just what went on in New York between uh, Trump and the, and the tabloids. Uh, his uh, universe was a little different than Nixon's, <laughs> but his, he, 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 he was interested in foreign affairs, obviously. <laughs> And uh, study a few of the presidents, uh, not many. But anyway, let's. Uh, the, one of the reasons we 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 address this is because in the, in our seminar, what we look at is executive leadership. I happen to do a book called Conservatives Without Conscience, which was about how the authoritarian personalities had dominated uh, st strains and elements of the Re Republican Party. There are two types of authoritarians. One is the authoritarian follower, and the other is the authoritarian leader. And of course, you can't have leaders without followers, and most of the authoritarians are followers. It's a, it's a very distinctive personality type uh, in, in the leadership. And one of the things I immediately noticed is Nixon, behind closed doors, is clearly an authoritarian personality. Very shy publicly, but not so privately. Uh, so we, uh, we, we dwell on this for just a minute. I mean, it's interesting. He's so shy that when he would have people come into the Oval Office, um, he would ask people like John or other people to give him a card so when this group came in, it, it, it had talking points, you know, just small talk, like, I hear you're in this bowling, you know, league or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, so he, it's interesting that a guy that shy, that introverted, would become president of the United States. Or, have, or pick the career he picked. Yeah. yeah. So, Which is uh, certainly... Uh, and it's, it's very different from Donald Trump on that score, that, who's an extrovert. I think uh, we had three authoritarian presidents for certain. Uh, I think Wilson and Nixon 
and of course now Trump. Uh, as I said, I, I started this subject because the late Senator Barry Goldwater was a friend of mine. Uh, his son and I are, uh, uh, were roommates in secondary school and remain friends to this day. And uh, after his dad retired, he, he, Barry Jr. called me one day and said, you know, he's really bored. He, he said, why don't you do a book with him? He'd love that. And so we actually decided to start it, the project on a book that would become Conservatives Without Conscience. It was a play on the senator's title. What had happened is he was worried about where Republicans were going uh, with the influence of the religious right. He said, I've, I've dealt with these people in Congress, and he said they will not, they can't negotiate, they've locked into positions, and they feel that they're acting on the word of God, and that makes it pretty hard to compromise. So he said, he said I'd like to explore that, why these people feel the way they do. And we started on the project, but I could realize it was, it was, it was taxing on him. He wasn't up to his normal self. And I told Barry Jr., I said, I think we ought to put this on the shelf until he's feeling better. And unfortunately, he never did. But I, I didn't let go of the project and about a, a decade later picked it back up and, and completed it. It's interesting uh, the, to, to look at the traits that uh, uh, we have here. If you look at the, the, as I said, there are two sides of the personalities, the social dominators of the leaders. The, uh, this is what people who are tested tell social scientists, not what uh, social scientists describe them as. Rather, this is from testing and decades of it now, about 50 years of research. But they're typically men, they're dominating, they oppose equality. They're desirous of personal power, they're amoral, they're intimidating and bullying, they're faintly hedonistic, they're vengeful, pitiless, exploitive, manipulative, dishonest, they'll cheat to win, highly prejudiced, they're racist, sexist, homophobic, homophobic, excuse me, they're mean-spirited, militant, nationalistic, uh, Jim, can you read a few of those? No, like, but does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't read it either. You can't read it either. No, the, the, the there we go. Had, had to, there we go. So in any event, we looked at these traits, and then the question was, you know, do Nixon and Trump share some traits that would tell us more about the, uh, we, we believe they're both authoritarian personalities, but, um, you know, what, what do we know about them? Well, we know, first of all, that both of them used turbulent times to acquire power. Nixon came in, and you know, it's, it's people in this room remember it, but if you try to describe it to younger people, um, it's hard for people to imagine 1968. 1968, we had the Tet Offensive, we had people opposing the Vietnam War across the country, we had anarchists running around, we had Martin Luther King assassinated, and two months later, Bobby Kennedy assassinated. It was really chaotic, and it felt very chaotic. That brought a huge backlash in what became known as the Nixon counter-revolution, and later became more benignly known as the Reagan revolution. So we, uh, today, we, we have been cycling through this backlash politics for the last 50 years. It cycles a little bit here, a little bit there, but really the Trump revolt is part of a backlash movement. It's the same thing that we kind of look at. So if we look at you know, the protests back then and we see similarities with you know, what was going on during the 2016 election and this backlash politics in 2016. So you look at the issues that in that year were driving things. This is a list that I put together that this is what we would ask people around the country do you agree or not agree with, it, with, with some of this stuff? And people had various thoughts about it, but clearly having an African-American president, uh, Clinton, what, what people considered Clinton elitism, um, and greatest social programs for the poor, Obamacare, gay marriage had a big impact that wasn't talked much about. Uh, Planned Parenthood abortion has been an issue since Roe v. Wade in 1973 and remains, in, a lot of people voted for Trump because of the Supreme Court. And um, so, uh, gro you know, growth in government, international trade, and then the, the other thing that we added to our mix is immigration and terrorism. So these are things that are causing people to say, we're losing what we have, we don't want to lose it, we want to stay where we are, we want to keep America great, and that it's, but it's the same impulse to move in, in, a, in a way that, that resists the change that people don't like that they're seeing. 
Um, so I, both I, of them are yeah, very similar. And, and I noticed immediately the uh, the way Trump picked up on the silent majority. You all, many of you in this room will recall this uh, clip. So tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. The more support I can have from the American people, the sooner that pledge can be redeemed. For the more divided we are at home, the less likely the enemy is to negotiate at Paris. That uh, support was guaranteed. The next morning, uh, the press was invited in to see the photographs. A little known was the fact that the White House staff had generated all those telegrams. So they, Alex Butterfield was in charge of that and had a pretty impressive stack by uh, the next morning. But the, one, the one thing that, that Nixon had there, and this is where he and Trump share this political brilliance, and that is understanding there's a great silent majority out there of people who feel they're not being listened to. And, you know, Nixon understood it. And did Trump understand it? Well, we found that that's true. Listen to this. Thank this you. Is, it's a term that... This is one month after he comes down the escalator. This is in Phoenix, okay? So listen to this, the very beginning of his uh, running for president. Thank you. It's a term that I haven't heard for years, but I really think it applies now more than maybe ever before. And that's the term, the silent majority. Have you all heard that? You don't hear it anymore. You don't hear it. When people start cutting up their credit cards at Macy's and won't go to Macy's anymore, when, when, when all of these things, and that's a big story, but nobody wants to write it, that's fine, I don't care about me. But, when you see the kind of power that the silent majority has, and the silent majority is a problem. They want to go out, they want to lead a good life, they want to work hard, they want to have their family, they, want to, they don't want to be involved in coming here and waiting on a line for hours and hours and coming in and listening to Trump. But the silent majority is back, and we're going to take the country back. How many people remember that? It's pretty distinctive. And, you know, there's really a real, it's interesting to me because Donald Trump was what, about 21 years old when Nixon was president? So he was really becoming politically aware when Nixon came in. And I think he's very influenced by. by very much. We, we also see a similarity with their feeling that the press is the enemy. Uh, Nixon certainly took that uh, about as far as he could at his time. Uh, Have you heard that tape where Nixon is saying to Kissinger, remember, Henry, the press is the enemy, the press is the enemy, the press is the enemy. The establishment is the enemy. The professors are the enemy. He's talking to a Harvard professor. Um, go and write that 100 times on a blackboard, um, which we don't think he did. We don't think Henry did that, uh, no. But, but we, we, did, we, we did run an interesting test as we traveled, particularly in the South, we found it was interesting, where we, I pulled out what I thought were Nixon's most prominent characteristics and traits. Uh, here's a listing of them. Uh, I was surprised when I started dealing with him to find out how insecure the man really was. He, uh, with a young staffer like myself, would often show off for me. Uh, it was conspicuous and it showed an insecurity that surprised me. Uh, his authoritarianism and his bullying just, just comes out of the tapes uh, behind closed doors. Uh, his dislike of elites, uh, his, he sought revenge on his enemies. In fact, I think if he had not a second term, uh, that would have been the dominant theme of his term. He was really planned to, to go after, I don't think any slight Nixon ever experienced in his life ever was forgotten. And he was going to use the machinery of the federal government against those people uh, throughout that second term. But of course that didn't happen. Uh, he had a fear of, he feared losing, uh, fairly passionate about it. He lied easily, tended to lie on big issues. Uh, and one of the things that, one of the reasons I'm convinced he resigned as he did is he had pulled many of the Republican leaders aside uh, as the protracted Watergate uh, 
episodes evolved, and uh, he, he looked them right square in the eyes and said, listen, uh, this is all there is, you don't have to worry about it, and what have you. Just lied to them. And that really is what hurt him when, when the tapes came out, the smoking gun tape would come out. Uh, he had that personal embarrassment he had to deal with. He covered up his mistakes. Uh, he blamed others, others and never really accepted responsibility for it himself. Finally, he was clearly a dirty campaigner, had no hesitation uh, about how low he would go to win. Winning was all. So when we would go around the country, we'd ask people, do these, do these traits appear to you to uh, also indicate, uh, are they what Trump, Trump thinks too? How many people here think that this is a true listing of Trump characteristics? Yeah, okay, so a lot of people. Um, it's interesting because as we went around the country, we had, whether we were in the South, the North, the West, a unanimity on all this, and yet people have different feelings about uh, supporting Trump and you know how they feel about him and so forth. So anyway, that was interesting. But this hating to lose is something we really like to focus on for lawyers, as for all of us, actually. Um, it has consequences. This, you know, you remember Nixon was very famous after he lost the, the race for the governor's race in 62, coming out and saying, well, you won't, gentlemen, this is my last press conference because you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around again. You know, he hated to lose. And what we found is that there is a lot of study that's been done. Do you guys, you know this guy? He's running, for, he, uh, Richard, I had first met him. Jim was joined, I was asked to uh, speak at the ABA in Boston before the ethics uh, and professionalism section, and Richard was, was on a panel along with Beth Nolan, who was, uh, Richard was uh, the White House counsel for ethics in George Bush's administration. He arrived incidentally after they'd made their torture decisions uh, and didn't think highly of those. Uh, he, uh, uh, and Beth Nolan was, had been Bill Clinton's uh, uh, White House counsel. But what was interesting is Richard and I had a long conversation. He knew a lot of the White House scandals well, did not know Watergate well, but he told me of this work he'd done where he'd studied the psychology of cover-up and he'd written in some length about it. Uh, this kind of sums it up uh, where he says that notes that psychological studies show that a person in a loss frame, which we'll briefly explain, uh, often makes risk preferring. Think about that. You're, you think you're going to lose, and you take a risk. In fact, this is how casinos make their money. Uh, they, they, they know you're more likely to double down in that condition than you will make a smart decision. In order to, uh, they do it in order to avoid a loss, even if, they risk, if, the, if the, the risk they take are irrational. This is all based on the, the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Traversky. Uh, Kahneman would receive the Nobel Prize in 2002, which that clip shows, but I, on the right is a copy of his book. Uh, I just noticed the other day the book has, I, my, my granddaughter just graduated, which is the reason I happen to be in the neighborhood, and uh, she, uh, uh, the older of the granddaughters, who's at Williams, is a math major, and I w was rereading uh, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and Franny and I got into a conversation, so she wanted me to send her a copy of the book. So we, and I, I think she'll understand it well. It's a great, it's not a page turner, but it, it's got wonderful information about the way our minds work. So, now, so what Kahneman found out is, he's a psychologist at Princeton. What he found out is we all have in our, uh, in our brains and the way we think certain biases that cause us to make stupid decisions all the time. Um, and one of the big things they studied and found out is how people approach loss or gain. And they found that they approach it very differently. Um, so if you're in a gain frame, that you're in the stock market, you're up $100, and you potentially could go up more, you look at all the facts and you make a rational decision. The opposite is true if you're in a loss frame. If you're down $100, and you look at all the evidence, and you possibly could lose twice as much, you, you tend to make irrational decisions when you're facing a loss because they found out one thing that's very simple, which is we all hate to lose much more than we like to win. 
About three times. Three times as much. So those of us who are Cleveland sports fans understand this. <laughs> um, but it's very true. Think about how you take a loss. So it, you don't, so the point is you become loss averse. And therefore, you're more likely to be Richard Nixon and cover up rather than listen to his young counsel who says, we've got to stop this. There's a cancer on your presidency. Or it's going to kill you. You're more likely to do irrational things. Think of Bill Clinton who, you know, was in the Oval Office and he had to admit a loss, that he had an, a, a sexual relationship with an intern versus going into a deposition and lying about it, committing perjury. That's loss frame in action. And what we tell lawyers, as we can tell all of you, is this is true for all of us. It's human. We all hate to lose so much more than we like to win. So when lawyers have clients come to them, they're all in the loss frame. They're all facing losses. And so you have to, you know, uh, understand to get out of that. What it hit John as bingo. This is exactly what happened in Watergate, and somehow you got out of that loss yeah, frame. I mean, my pattern is very clear. Where I initially think that no one's. First of all, I think we're not in a criminal situation. Although I realize their criminal potentials, I try to convince my superior, John Ehrlichman, we should bring a counsel in a criminal lawyer, so we don't make the mistake. Uh, I today understand why he dismissed me on it, because he had serious problems he didn't want me to know about, and he wasn't about to talk about them. But in Watergate, you, what you do is, you, particularly when I was going through the tapes and uh, had learned some of the rudiments of the, of the loss frame, and I can hear it even more once Jim and I uh, started assembling these tapes for these, these programs, it's just, one person after another in or out of the loss frame. Uh, and it's very telling. We're not going to go through all that, uh, but I'm going to take you to the moment where I realize uh, that I'm in the loss frame. And it's a conversation where Chuck Colson has talked to uh, Howard Hunt and learned from Hunt uh, that he's unhappy that he's not receiving an, as much money as he'd like to receive. And it's when I discovered there's really a quid pro quo. Uh, I thought initially defense funds were not uncommon. Uh, I could understand why you wouldn't want to politically advertise it uh, and do it in quiet. Uh, but it really became this next tape that I'm going to play that Colson brought a copy of it down on a dicta belt. He recorded all of his calls. Many in the White House did. I didn't. Uh, but I listened to it. Had a very different reaction than Colson. So let me, before we actually, let me set this up for you. How many people know who Howard Hunt is? Most of you. Okay, so Hunt is one of the burglars who helps put together the Watergate burglary. He's not arrested that night, but he's later arrested. And he is going to be, he's indicted, uh, and he's going to be tried before a guy named John Sirica, a really tough judge, who is saying, if these guys are found guilty, I'm going to put them away for 40 years. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure on him. And once they're arrested, the White House begins paying their, their lawyers and begins paying their family what becomes known as hush money. Well, the White House doesn't, but it facilitates it. Right. And so what happens um, is, as John was saying, you know, paying a defense fund, the Berrigan brothers, you know, there are all these defense funds where you want to support somebody who's uh, in trouble or whatever, if you do it in an open and obvious way. Well, Paul Manafort recently set up a website for those who are inclined to donate. Right. And that's not obstruction of justice. No. <laughs> but when you're doing it and it's brown paper bags being delivered to airports, um, <laughs> it's, it's the message is to stay quiet. And we'll, this is, the, as John said, the quid pro quo. You keep quiet. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. And there eventually comes a point where there's a discussion of pardon. And we talk about that a lot today. But the issue is whether or not a pardon, and we'll talk about that after we listen to this, but whether a pardon could be an obstruction of justice, OK? So we'll talk about that. But at this point, John is, this is after the election. It's just over. Howard Hunt's worried that they're going to be forgotten and tried in January 1973. Um, and that they'll forget about it. The, the White House, they've won. You know, what difference does it make? So. Here, listen to this. Hello. Hi. 
How are we doing? I'll uh, about as well as you'd be expected. How are you? Uh, just about the same. We're face trying to hold the pieces together. Yeah, congratulations on your victory. Thank you. Uh, you I'm sorry that uh, we haven't been celebrating it together with some uh, good champagne and uh, good scotch. But, uh, well, there may yet come a time. Oh, no. It will come. I assure you. Let me, uh, let me, before you say anything, let me say a couple of things. One, uh, I don't know what's going on here other than I am told that uh, everybody's going to come out all right. That's all I know. And uh, I've deliberately not asked any specific questions right. for this reason. But um, I have my own ideas about how things will turn out. Uh -huh. but, and I'm not worried about a man, you shouldn't be, but... Well, the reason I called you was to make, uh, get back to the beginning here, is because the commitments that were made to all of us at the onset have not been kept. And there's a great deal of unease and concern on the part of seven defendants, and possibly, well, I'm quite sure, me least of all. But uh, there's a great deal of... Uh, of uh, financial expense here that has not been covered and what we've been getting has been coming in very minor drips and drafts and uh, Parkinson who has been the go-between with my attorney it doesn't seem to be very effective and we're now reaching a point at which uh, okay you've told me all don't tell me anymore because I, I understand it let me, uh, let me just uh, because these people have really got to dig this is a long haul thing and stakes are very very high and I thought that you would want to know that this thing must not break apart uh, for foolish reasons. I agree. Well, oh no, Christ, no, everybody gets it. Yeah, and while we get, uh, you know, third, fourth hand reassurances, still the, the ready is not available. Mm -hmm. I saw That's the basic problem. I saw you. I saw you. Okay. When Chuck brought that down, he was delighted in the initial part of the conversation because there was some sus very strong suspicion that Colson had somehow been involved in the setting up and the planning of the Watergate. But he, through uh, cross-examination and leading questions, gets himself really cleared in the conversation. But he's, then he, he, has, he said to me, what are you going to do about this demand? And I said, I don't have a clue. Uh, but I had heard when he said, uh, mentioned the ready, uh, and it's not coming fast enough and things are going to break apart, uh, by the end of that conversation, I knew we were buying silence. There was no question. So the, the light goes on for John. And what's, what's interesting about that conversation, I mean, Colson's a lawyer, and he's saying, don't tell me anymore. You know, I don't want to hear anymore. Uh, and this is like a mob conversation. You know, the ready's not coming, you know, meaning the money is not coming. And so all of a sudden, John is flicked into this complete awareness, you know, like total enlightenment, right. um, that they are involved in obstructing justice by keeping these people from testifying. So he goes and looks it up in the, in the books, and suddenly he knows he's in trouble. And he begins to do things like people in the lost frame destroying evidence and things like that. And it takes all the way until March when things are really starting to unravel for him to finally say enough. We got to stop. I got to go tell the president we got to stop on March 21. He does the famous cancer on the presidency talk. So let's just listen to one segment of this and then we got to transition to Q&A. But this is John on March 21, 1973. Maybe. Uh, the reason I thought we ought to talk this morning is because in, in our conversations, uh, I, have, I have the impression that you don't know everything I know, and it makes it very difficult for you to make judgments that, uh, that only you can make right. on some of these things, and I thought that you guys are never I don't know why you would be able to do something. Well, let me, let, me, let me give you my overall first. I think, I think that uh, there's no doubt about the seriousness of the problem we've we got. We have a cancer within, close to the presidency, that's growing. It's growing daily. It's compounding. It grows geometrically now because it compounds itself. 
that'll be clear as I explain, you know, some of the details uh, of why it is. And basically, it's because one, we're being blackmailed. Two, uh, people are going to start perjuring themselves very quickly that have not had to perjure themselves to protect other people and the like. And that is just, and there's no assurance that that won't bust. So how's that? Um, you know, it's interesting because that conversation, John had no time to prepare, no notes, and he then goes back. It's like a movie, the big beginning. There's a cancer on the presidency. He goes back to say, here's what we've done. Here's what's happened. We got to stop it. Doesn't happen. Nixon sends John to uh, Camp David to write a false report. John decides he's not going to do it, gets a lawyer, we, helps him get out of this loss frame. He's already moving himself out of this loss frame. and. Uh, before you know it, he's before the Senate uh, saying, I told the president there was a cancer going on his presidency, and that's the iconic moment from that testimony. You just heard that's exactly what he said to him on the tape. Um, so four, four and a half decades later, and, and, and now being a, a pundit, I guess, for CNN and following what's happening with the Trump administration, uh, I, I've, I've watched it closely. Uh, I know and have followed the details of how it started with Flynn and the firing of Comey. Uh, I've been looking for a smoking gun. Is the June 9 meeting at the Trump Towers uh, a smoking gun? I don't think so. It, notwithstanding all the Russians and, and the ties that are developing and the names and, and players that are uh, involved, nor do I think necessarily that uh, Stormy is going to take this anywhere. So a sort of a rush to a, into a Q&A, uh, I don't think that uh, we're at Watergate 2.0, at least not yet. Uh, we're getting close, though. But to finish this little session up before we open up for questions, uh, we've been hard on Nixon. We've been a little hard on, not too hard on Trump tonight. Uh, but I think that Nixon did, in the end, get it. And I think uh, this brief clip from his farewell speech uh, shows how he got it. This is right before he flies off and after the resignation. It's only a beginning, always. The young must know it. The old must know it. They must always sustain us. Because the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. And so I say to you on this occasion, we leave. We leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you've done. We want you to continue to serve in government if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. Those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. And so we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility. Thank you very much. So that's, you know, it's pretty profound in the sense that he recognizes that it's his hatred of others that destroyed him. Uh, so he really does get it at the very end there about what happened. Notice, in his notice what Jim is doing with his hand is exactly what Nixon did with his. He's pointed at himself. I and mean, yeah. the body language is, is very clear in that, in that speech. Right. That, uh, so we, we've did. got, uh, Gwen has told us that we need to go out to sign books. 
uh, and so we've got to get out of here. But why don't we have two or three questions before, and then if you have other questions, feel free to, in the book signing, to come up and ask them. We're both happy to talk about all that. Yes, we'll take two or three questions. That's it, folks. I'm going to have you remain in your seats and thank these wonderful gentlemen. But then we're going to take him out the back way while you go out the other way, and there'll be plenty of time in the rotunda for you to visit and have books signed and have brief conversations with him. Are you going to take the mic out to the audience for the questions? I am. Good. Or else repeat the questions. Okay. So the first three that have their hand up. There's one, there's two, and there's three. Gentlemen, thank you for sharing this. One question that has come up is, you know, fake news, but there's a move afoot with tariff on newsprint. My Akron Beacon Journal has gone up by 50%. Um, there's another which is gonna drive a lot of people from obviously taking the journal. There's also a study that was just done that when small town newspapers go out of print, the price of government goes up. Now that being the case, is can you make any comment about this, where this is going? Because this is a perfect, to me, opportunity to shut down the free press. Well, it's, it, it's a fascinating question uh, for many, uh, multiple reasons. One is that Jim's wife is here, and she's a reporter with the Cleveland Plain Dealer <laughs> and has watched the newsroom uh, get smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, it's a problem we're all aware of. And uh, I've watched the same thing at, with the Los Angeles Times, where it's, it's gotten uh, the same problems. Uh, so it. it we obviously, for the old print journalism, it, it is a transition time. Uh, we're getting more information than we ever received at any time uh, in our human history uh, through the internet. So it's not the lack of information, but it's the quality of the information. And I have just found uh, Trump has resulted, yes, in lots of threats about fake news. But I happen to be an optimist in the journalism I'm seeing that's emerging in the Washington Post, in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, in the New Yorker magazine. I mean, we're getting, we're getting Watergate quality journalism again, uh, which forever changed the presidency. So I'm, I'm not terribly concerned that, that Trump is going to prevail. Uh, his base, as it happens, uh, is not uh, somebody who is particularly interested in local journalism or any journalism. Uh, they are the low, low end of the totem pole on, on being information voters. So I think your question's important. I think it's, uh, vigilance is important. But I, as I say, I think that there's a brighter picture coming out of all this. And I, I would say one thing, which is that the internet was already killing newspapers before Trump came in. So, and I think that has a lot to do with it. But I do think what you need to be careful about is what he keeps talking about, which is changing the libel laws um, to make it much easier to go after people under libel standards. That's a dangerous thing. But that's going to take a constitutional amendment. Yeah, and then, and then the right Supreme Court. Forgive uh, me, gentlemen, but we have another question here in the back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, coming of age in uh, New York in the 80s, uh, Trump's behavior has been no surprise to me as corroborating a point you made earlier. But I guess call me naive, but I'm just shocked how feckless the uh, Republican leadership in Congress has been. I was wondering if you could comment on the parallels of the Republican leadership back during the Watergate days. By the way, how many people agree with that comment by show of hands? It's, uh, you know, I happen to have first worked in the House of Representatives, and I happened to be there at a time when Congress worked. We did, when I was there, for example, 64 Voting Rights, or 64 Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act, 18-year-old vote, the 25th Amendment, and Republicans and Democrats uh, worked together. I happened to work for uh, the, the person who was the ranking minority member of the House Judiciary Committee, was from Ohio, Bill McCulloch, uh, who had no problem tro crossing the aisle. So I, I know the institution has the potential of working again. Uh, I don't know 
uh, you know, I don't believe it's likely that Trump will ever be impeached. He might be impeached by the House. He'll never be removed by the Senate. There are not enough votes uh, or found guilty by the Senate. So uh, regardless of one's feeling on that, it just, I just think the process is not going to happen. Uh, it is a surprising lack of oversight by the House uh, and the Senate of, of this administration. I think that'll probably change. We have a, a, a Democratic House and a Republican Senate uh, in the next, uh, uh, the last two years of his term. I suspect it will change. But I, I cannot explain the leadership's Obviously, they're getting, they're getting judges on, on the bench they're happy with, uh, and that's where the, most of their focus has been. Last question. Question is, I think you're correct there, but what happened to the million dollars that was going on? You know, the payoff million dollars? Okay, so the question, is, the question is about the million dollars that John talked about in that same conversation, March 21, Nixon says, how much money do you think it'll take to keep these guys quiet? And uh, John pulls out of his uh, head. Um, Thin air. I, yeah, I think, I, think, I think it'll cost a million dollars thinking he'll shock Nixon and Nixon will say, I'm not gonna do that, but just the opposite happened. What happened? Uh, I, in the March 25th conversation, I literally took Nixon through every conceivable problem I could think of that would bring his fist down on the desk where he'd say, this has to end. Uh, everything I raised, he had an answer for, including the million dollars. He said, that's no problem. When I later, when I later listened to all of the tapes, and particularly in sequence, I realized after I left the office that morning, he goes to Rose Woods in the little ante office and asks her how much is in the slush fund. Uh, and she says, well, there's about 400. Uh, he, he says, well, I, okay. And he's then, within days, is selling an ambassadorship to help Mitchell uh, raise money uh, to keep the cash flowing. So Nixon is into Watergate up to his neck. Uh, the, the, the gentleman who asked what happened to the million dollars, it never really got raised. Uh, and what was there uh, ended up going to the Democrats because they had to pay in the civil suit everything they had left in their kitty before it was uh, closed down. So let us uh, conclude here, Gwen. First of all, thank you, and thank you to the Hudson <laughs> Library. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah.